In this lecture, I'd like to continue our discussion of the logistic regression model, uh, diving into a few additional variants of this model and also presenting the Bayesian version, which we didn't cover in the original lecture on logistic regression. So as a reminder, the logistic regression is a common model uh, when analyzing Boolean data, you know, zero, one data, true, false, present, absent sort of data, where we assume uh, a Bernoulli likelihood, which is just a special case of the binomial with a sample size of one. And we assume a, a logit link uh, between the linear model and uh, the probability in, in the Bernoulli. And then for the Bayesian version of this, we would need to put uh, priors on our betas. As a reminder, the logit is the log of the odds. Um, and it basically takes on this sigmoidal shape, uh, accounting for the fact that uh, probabilities have to be bound between zero and one. So it's a function that asymptotes uh, to zero in one direction and to one in, in the other direction. And then as a reminder, graphically, we're depicting a model where we have our response variable y being related to our covariate x and our parameters beta, and then our parameter model being uh, the priors on that beta. Also, as a reminder, we talked about how when you visualize um, logistic data, it's often hard to see the patterns in the data itself. So one thing that's commonly done is to, to smooth that data or to bin that data to get an idea of the underlying pattern. In the previous lecture, we also talked about uh, the the maximum likelihood options for fitting logistic regression, one being the uh, built-in GLM function in R and, and many other statistical packages, where unlike LM, where we just specify the family, or specify the formula, in GLM, we also need to specify that, that this is a binomial probability distribution uh, with a logit link. Uh, and then the second option being coding out the log likelihood function to optimize numerically ourselves which really isn't uh, that different than writing down our linear uh, regression model, except we have a binomial uh, error model and this uh, logit link on the regression model. And again, this is showing uh, that best fit model and comparing that to our empirical bin estimates. And then noting, which we covered in the previous lecture, uh, the um, results that come out of that GLM function, which include uh, the AIC and the parameter estimates and the errors and our ability to put uh, a compass interval around uh, this logistic model. We will note that we often don't put predictive intervals around logistic models because the predictions are only taking on the values of zero and one. So the, the lower compass interval would stay at zero unless there was very few zeros. Uh, and the upper compass intervals would stay at one unless there were very few ones. We also talked in the previous lecture about some of the alternative link functions, uh, and here just showing how those were fit in the kind of the uh, GLM function that comes built into R. Moving beyond the uh, maximum likelihood version of the logistic model, uh, the logistic is also not hard to code up in JAGs. Uh, so here, uh, most of this code is what we would have seen in a standard uh, normal uh, regression model coded up in JAGs where we have a prior in our betas. Uh, the one thing that's notab notably absent relative to the uh, standard uh, regression model with a normal error is that we don't have a prior on sigma because there is no sigma, no residual standard deviation. Uh, in the logistic regression. Instead, we have a, a Bernoulli model that just is predicting uh, zeros and ones, uh, and we only have that kind of Bernoulli sampling error, and we don't need to specify an additional variance term to describe that Bernoulli sampling error. And then for the process model, we have this logit link uh, showing up on the left-hand side here, and is similar to as what was noted in our um, Poisson regression model, uh, the logit is one of the two functions that's allowed to be on the left-hand side of an equation uh, within JAGS. And we don't, yeah, which is, saves us the nice step of having to, you know, calculate 
uh, mu and then calculating the log odds of that mu. Sorry, calculate, yeah, the linear model and then calculating the log odds based on that, which we've taken more steps. Uh, so here's an example with uh, that same data set we've looked at before, but now fit in, in the Bayesian version where we get uh, prediction of the mean and we get our 95% our, uh, credible intervals that are generated again just by basic Monte Carlo simulation. Okay, so what I want to do in the, the rest of this lecture is to now dive into uh, a few additional variants of logistic regression um, and, and to dive into particularly one example that analysis that shows uh, how to apply this uh, to more complex analyses with, with non-trivial amounts of data and non-trivial number of covariates. Um, specifically, I'm going to start with um, an analysis that uh, comes out of uh, a paper that uh, I published about a decade ago, uh, looking at patterns of, of tree mortality uh, across the eastern U.S., uh, where the goal was to develop a model to predict annual survival probability. So that row is the survival probability, which is modeled as a logit link uh, to a linear model, some x beta. Uh, but with a notable difference that now in, in the Bernoulli uh, likelihood, uh, we have this row raised to the t, this little t, where that little t is time. And this variant, this logistic exponential model, uh, is a variant that, that is used when the, the measurement period is not equal. So this goes back to one of the things we, we discussed earlier when we were learning maximum likelihood uh, and develop one of our first likelihood models for survival, noting how survival, uh, you know, when, when we have uh, kind of a waiting time for, for uh, between census intervals. Uh, so this accounts for the fact that in the data set that I'm using, and which in this case is U.S. Forest Service forest inventory data, that uh, the plots are not measured every year. They typically are measured on a, a five to 10 or sometimes even 15 year period between resensing. So we need to raise that survival probability per year into, into the number of years. Uh, and in this T in this case can actually be fractional because we can, you know, say go, you know, four and a half years or seven and three quarters years between censuses. Uh, but other than that, this is otherwise identical to the, the standard logistic regression. It's just something you'd have to, to implement yourself rather than uh, relying on uh, pre-existing CAN software. Uh, assumed a normal prior on the um, slopes and intercepts. And I fit this uh, using uh, a Metropolis MCMC, uh, 50,000 steps uh, with six to 20,000 uh, iterations removed for burn-in, and then I thinned a third of this out to address autocorrelation. Um, and uh, the, the number of steps removed for burn-in was variable because I actually ran this analysis uh, on a number of different plant functional types, uh, and the time it took to burn-in varied a little bit from uh, across those different functional types. This was a fairly large data set, so it was covering coming from the full extent of the Eastern Temperate Forest region uh, with tens of thousands of forest plots scattered across that region and, and hundreds of thousands of, of individual repeat tree measurements occurring across those plots. Uh, normally, survival models are, are hard to fit because uh, mortality is such a small uh, low probability event, you know, a background rate here is less than 1%. Uh, but in this case, because we have hundreds of thousands of observations, we can actually still fit uh, fairly complex models with a number of covariates uh, because we actually have the statistical power to do so. So here we look, we were looking at uh, five, sorry, four different categories of covariates affecting survival, uh, climatic variables, such as precipitation, summer maximum temperature and winter minim minimum temperature, uh, air pollution variables such as uh, NO3 deposition, SO4 deposition, and ozone. So this is basically nitrogen deposition, acid rain, and ozone. Uh, number of abiotic uh, 
variables occurring at the landscape scale, such as elevation, slope, uh, uh, in index of radiation, solar radiation, and a topographic uh, moisture index, kind of giving us a, a measure of uh, hydrological water routing on the landscape. And then a number of stand scale biotic variables, such as uh, DBH, the diameter of breast height, which is a measure of the size of the tree itself. Uh, and then the, the basal area within that stand, so kind of a measure of how much uh, how many other trees are in that area and how large those trees are, and then the age of the stand, with ex you know, expectation that survival is going to change as the stand ages. Uh, for each of those uh, covariates and for each of those uh, different functional types, we were able to uh, generate analyses that look like this. So to quickly walk you through this, uh, first, uh, what I did was bin the data to get an understanding of what the pattern in the data actually looked like. So these black circles are the binned means across, in this case, a, a gradient of precipitation values. And the binned data CI come from the, the expectations you would get right, by fitting the, the conjugate beta binomial model uh, to the data within that bin. So that's a purely statistical estimate of the mortality probability within that bin. Uh, the next thing I did is, you know, after fitting the full logistic regression that had all of the covariates, um, I can make a prediction for uh, that model. Uh, first, by holding every variable except this one at its mean, and that's what this dark blue line is, so that I held every variable except uh, precipitation at its mean value and made a prediction of how mortality would change uh, as precipitation changed. Um, we can see that actually doesn't fit the data great, uh, but that's because uh, other things are changing other than just diameter. So the other thing I did is I made predictions in the model uh, with full covariates and then bin those uh, predictions uh, the same way that I bin the data. And so the blue line are the the bin the bin mean uh, predictions, uh, including those full covariates. And so you actually see that the that light blue line, which accounts for the covariance structure across the different variables, actually does a very good job of capturing the actual numerical values and patterns uh, in the survival. You know, even though there's a systematic offset between the mean uh, prediction and, and the prediction the mean of the Prediction. So the difference between the blue line and the uh, green line, again, is in many ways a reflection of, of Jensen's inequality. But you can't just plug the mean of something in and get the me right mean prediction out. The other thing you note is that the predictions start to break down uh, when the uh, precipitation gets higher, in this case above about maybe 1.6. Uh, but that's also uh, the point at which the, the data confidence intervals start getting very large. So we don't actually have much confidence in this high precipitation range over here. Uh, this panel shows a similar set of plots, but now looking at uh, all 10 of the PFTs that we can consider. And again, uh, PFT is a plant functional type. So these are our early successional hardwoods, our northern mid-successional hardwoods, southern mid-successional hardwoods, late successional hardwoods, uh, northern pines, southern pines, mid-successional conifers, late successional conifers, uh, hydric species, so species that, that tend to prefer, prefer wet conditions, like riparian species and wetland species, and then our evergreen hardwood species. So this is distinct from our conifers. These are our angiosperms that are evergreen. Um, in this case, we're looking at the response to uh, ozone pollution expressed in terms of the eight, eight hour maximum in terms of parts per million on the x axis. And this graph also has a unique addition, which is this dashed yellow line here at uh, 0.075, which is actually the EPA uh, standard uh, limit at the time that this analysis was performed. I should note that this analysis actually has gone into. Uh, the result of this analysis is, has helped inform EPA's uh, newer proposals for adjusting that, that standard. Because one of the things we do see is that um, for every uh, PFT where there is a, a significant 
relationship. Uh, most of those show a, a strong effect of uh, increasing ozone causing an increase in mortality, the exception being the late successional conifers, uh, which are, are fairly flat. Uh, our mid successional conifers are, are kind of noisy, and uh, our northern mid hardwoods uh, were also non significant. Um, you can also see in a few cases, such as this late successional hardwood, that uh, we actually do kind of see a threshold response around that EPA. Uh, limit and these evergreens, which are showing a very highly sensitive uh, response to ozone pollution. Again, and then like, like our northern pines are showing a bit of a nonlinear response there in the in the light blue. Uh, for most of the variables we we fit in this model, we're just considering a simple uh, logit linear relationship. The one exception to that was tree size itself. Uh, where there was clearly a nonlinear pattern in the in the data itself, so uh, these blue lines show the fit to a nonlinear model that considered uh, both an overall trend in the diameter response, but also the potential for there to be a unimodal uh, response to um, where, where mortality was elevated at some other size class in the middle, and this often was used to reflect. Uh, uh, you know, this, these varying patterns of tree mortality with tree size. Uh, some, some of the species, such as southern pines, follow what is often thought of as kind of this classic J-shaped uh, pattern of, of high mortality at uh, lower size classes, lower mortality in between, and then mortality rising at the higher side classes, kind of an indication of senescence. Uh, but in many other functional groups, that, that midpoint was uh, that mortality was peaked in between, which uh, the, the working hypothesis in this paper was actually that this is a reflection of uh, a self-thinning period where uh, trees undergo uh, elevated mortality rates uh, due to what's called the self-thinning law. So when trees enter the canopy and, and have to compete against each other for light. One of the things that I could do out of this analysis was to also calculate uh, an estimate of how uh, sensitive the results were to each of the, the covariates for each of the uh, functional types. So in here, our index of sensitivity is actually the, the predictive standard deviation. So we uh, pre made predictions uh, for survival, uh, holding every variable except that one being considered constant, but allowing that variable that um, we were calculating sensitive the sensitivity to 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 actually vary over its its full empirical range, of, you know, just according to the the sample distribution. Uh, and then to uh, convert this to units that are more easily interpretable, we multiplied by that by a thousand, just because again the survival rates are very high, the mortality rates are very low, and just to make it easier to read. Um, uh, we did that. I'll also note that uh, gray indicates non-significant effects, and the other colors, white, yellow, and orange, are just for convenience. They aren't actual tests, but the, the uh, white cells are less than one, uh, yellow are between one and 10, and uh, any orange values are a sensitivity greater than 10. So the orange values indicate the highest sensitivity. If we look uh, across each row, we can see the mean sensitivity of that functional type. So we can see that, for example, our evergreen um, hardwoods tend to be highly sensitive in their uh, survival, while things like our mid and late successional conifers tend to have low sensitivity. Their survival rates tend to have low sensitivity to environmental variables. If we look vertically, you know, down a column, we can see kind of the aggregate effect of different covariates in terms of predicting overall survival. Uh, the, the largest effects actually come out in terms of responses to atmospheric pollution, uh, where the, the, the highest sensitivity is to, to, acid, to acid rain, to acid deposition, uh, both in terms of SO4 and NO3. Uh, one thing we would note, though, is that uh, SO4 tended to have a negative effect on survival. NO3 tended to have a positive effect because that's well, and it does contribute to acidity. It also contributes nitrogen, which is essentially a fertilizer. Uh, 
but that also the, the spatial patterns of these two are, are highly correlated. So in this case, we also calculated this n by s term, which uh, looked at the joint effect of nitrogen and sulfur deposition, um, kind of capturing the covariance between those two. So you might think of uh, those two pollutants uh, showing this joint effect and, uh, and then this effect of ozone. And if you consider these two jointly, then actually the most important variable is this uh, effect of tree size being the overwhelming largest driver of tree survival. Uh, and then we see that the, the pollutants and uh, summer maximum temperatures are kind of the, the next most important factors. And this table just shows the, the direction of those covariate effects. So, so we can see, for example, that the acid deposition is predominantly negative effect, ozone is predominantly negative effect, nitrogen is predominantly a positive effect. Uh, other things uh, are often mixed. They affect some things positively, they affect other things negatively. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to talk about in terms of uh, thinking about logistic regression is a, is a third variant. Uh, we've covered the normal lo logistic, the logit uh, exponential, and now I want to talk a, a third variant called the logit normal model. In the logit normal model, we, uh, are especially, we are essentially trying to account for the fact uh, that sometimes that, that Bernoulli uh, sampling probability is, is not sufficient to capture uh, the observed variability we see uh, within systems. So the Bernoulli uh, data model only accounts for sampling error. Um, sorry. Um, but we can account for additional, you know, what we'd call extra binomial variation. So variation beyond uh, just that Bernoulli sampling probability. Uh, they can be used to account for the fact that um, often our, our covariates don't account for the full uh, full mean risk in a situation or the fact that the, the logistic model is, is not a perfect process model. So we're kind of accounting for model structural error uh, using this extra binomial variability. So if we write this out, we have our data being Bernoulli distributed around some theta. Uh, which is our, in this case, uh, you know, our probability. We have a logit theta with this x beta, but now we have some, plus some epsilon where we assume that epsilon is normally distributed. So we have both this normal error, normal residual error and this Bernoulli sampling error. Should note that in practice, the, the logit normal model can show fairly high sensitivity to your choice of, of prior and sigma, because remember, the only thing we're seeing in the data uh, are zeros and ones. And we're not using those zeros and ones to calculate, directly to calculate that variance, because that prim primarily is impacting uh, the Bernoulli. Um, how we would implement this? Uh, this code looks actually very similar to our to both our, our logistic regression and our normal regression in the sense that we have a prior on beta, uh, we have a prior on sigma, uh, we have a, a calculation from our process model of the expected value of y being our x beta, uh, and now we have our mu, our, our mean, uh, being distributed normally around that expected value with some sigma. We then uh, load it transform that expect that mu into a theta and then use that uh, in the Bernoulli. So we have both this, this sigma variability uh, as kind of a process error and we have this Bernoulli variability as kind of an observation error. And this uh, figure shows the result of fitting uh, that model to this data that we've looked at before uh, where the, the black dotted lines are you know, just accounting for that that uh, uh, that expected value of y, that that uh, variability coming from kind of the, the just the standard logistic model, and then the red line is kind of this uh, logit uh, logit normal model where we account for both the uh, Bernoulli sampling error error and the um, this extra binomial normal variability. So 
because we have that extra normal variability, this interval is, is going to be a bit, a bit wider and represents you know, greater structural uncertainty about the model, particularly in this, this middle range of uh, where you have the highest sensitivity to X.